Hello. Good morning. I'm Christopher Scalchoons, Vice President of Research at the Immune Deficiency Foundation, and I'd like to welcome you today to the session, Clinical Research Trials in You. At this time, I'd like everyone to please welcome our presenters. We have Dr. Jason Brandt of Farming Healthcare, Dr. Ali Smith of IQVIA, and Elizabeth Buffy Garabedian, who's a research nurse at the National Institutes of Health. So you guys have probably all seen some of these disclaimers. So we have that up here as well. I have an attorney with a gun to my head and he said, I just have to show this briefly. So there you go, don't have to shoot. All right, this is one of my favorite quotes and I've used this last year at the Rare of the Rare. I use this everywhere, quite honestly. So here's the quote, doctors pour drugs of which they know little to cure diseases of which they know less into patients of whom they know nothing. So that was Moliere, and he was a, a French actor and a dramatist, right? And, you know, things have changed over the years, right? And more and more, um, obviously, this is less and less true, particularly among some of the great presenters we've had at this conference. They know quite a bit of these things and want to hear the patient perspective. Um, but the point is, without your participation, without your being involved in these things, nothing happens. Of patients who, whom, whom they know nothing, right? There would be no new treatments without your participation in trials, no therapies or medicines, certainly no cures that are on the horizon, and no improvements in our lives and lives of our loved ones. Every single one of you is critical to making this happen. But we need your help, right? So your participation in clinical trials or in research studies, whether they be surveys or individual interviews with folks, can really change the future for us. Your experiences, your history, your wants, your needs, they can all become data. Data that we need and the government needs to help approve the medications and the therapies that we know can dramatically improve the lives of ourselves and of our loved ones. You can choose to be part of this. With that, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to our first uh, presenter, Dr. Jason Brandt. Jason, please go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Chris. Excellent. Um, my name is Jason Brad. I'm a medical director at uh, a, a pharmaceutical biotech company called Farming, based out of the Netherlands. Um, we're going to briefly introduce you to Farming, just so you know who we are. Um, then we're going to talk about how biotech companies get ideas for new products. We generally go over the drug development process uh, with a, a very U.S. focus, and then uh, look at success rates, so you can get a, some context about um, what to expect with the clinical trials. Obviously, this presentation is my own views, and uh, this presentation is um, largely from a U.S. perspective. So Farming is a, a rel relatively small company. It's been around for over 30 years, but uh, is fairly new as far as uh, developing products. Uh, it is a global company, and uh, we are a uh, commercial stage. We do have a product that's approved in the United States, and we're uh, uh, developing products for rare diseases, um, new products in highly unmet uh, medical need areas. Um, our CEO is over in the Netherlands, his name's Simon. He's a physician, which is kind of unique. And uh, our company's strategy is to be one of the leading uh, biopharmaceutical companies um, offering treatment options for patients with high unmet medical needs, particularly in rare diseases. So in general, as a, a company, how do you um, find new ideas? How do you look for possible products to develop? Um, if we look at this, this Venn diagram at the top at uh, 12 o'clock or noon, um, basically you have to define an unmet medical need. So you have to talk to patients, you have to talk to caregivers and care partners, um, talk to the medical community and find true unmet medical needs um, where there, there aren't available options or the options that are available just aren't um, meeting the needs of the, the patient population. So then moving to the right, um, we have to figure out once the unmet medical needs identified, how does this happen? What's the biology behind it, which we call mechanism of disease? Um, we have to clearly define um, the underlying um, process for the disease so we can find a possible um, target in that process to uh, develop a product for. So once we develop a, a possible target, we have to screen um, thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of possible solutions for that, that target. So um, these compounds that uh, um, you see there's a, we'll show a slide in a minute that shows the, the uh, screening that has to be done just to find one that might, might possibly um, improve the disease state. 
And then once you found a compound, you have to do things to optimize it. Um, currently in one of the clinical development programs we have, we have to develop the, uh, a pediatric formulation of the compound, which requires work um, because a significant number of the patients are in, in a pediatric population. And then after you've done all this, uh, you spend uh, time and uh, research uh, money, you have to determine if there's actually a market. Um, yeah, as a company, we have uh, shareholders, um, we have to make a profit. So we have to determine if we can actually um, have a sustainable business or a market um, once we determine um, a possible area of unmet need. So this is a typical slide you'll see. The big red bubbles show um, the number of compounds at various stages going from left to right um, the left side of the slide is preclinical, which is in, not in humans. And then in the middle of the slide, you have clinical trials, phase one through three. And then you, on the far right, you have FDA um, submission and review um, to see if you can get a drug approved. And the, the big take home here is that uh, if you look at the red bubble on the left, we have to look at probably on average about 10,000 possible uh, compounds to get 250 that could possibly um, go into a human trial. And then even then only five make it into this phase one, which is the first in human studies. And of those five that we might test in, in humans, only one on average will get approved and uh, be, be available for use in the, in the market. So the success rate um, for clinical trials uh, for a drug to survive all the way through FDA approval is only about 12%. Um, so we have to do a lot of research to get one drug approved and, and have to have um, um, some wherewithal to stick with um, the development process. The, the development process is very expensive, on average about uh, you know, $2.5 billion, and this is in 2013 um, dollars, is spent to develop a drug. The average time to develop the drug is roughly 10 years, um, so it takes a, a long time to do that. And then about 31% of the medicines developed today are in rare disease. And we've been seeing this increase um, in recent years. There's a higher percent of development that's attributed to rare disease, um, rare diseases um, as compared to um, diseases in the wider population. One thing to be aware of, of, even though we call these rare diseases, they're not really that rare. About 10% of Americans are affected by rare disease. There's over 7,000 um, rare diseases known to exist and many more are being identified you know, every year. And then about 95% of these rare diseases don't have a, a treatment that's approved in the United States. If you look at uh, what, what pharmaceutical and biotech companies have to invest um, you know, to make sure that the, they can get products to market, uh, if you look at the, the very bottom line, this S&P total market index, on average, a, a company in the US across all industries spends about two two and a half percent of the revenue on research and development. For pharmaceuticals, that's in biotech, that's at least 25%, sometimes a lot higher of the revenue. And some, some of the companies actually don't make revenue and they're, they're completely um, focused on R&D. So in summary, you know, biotech companies expend a significant amount of um, resource, um, you know, both in, in people and time and revenue to develop new products. Um, a lot of companies nowadays are highly focused on unmet medical needs, particularly in rare disease. Um, the product development pathway requires many years and, and considerable <laughs> investment to uh, get a product to market. And there's a high rate of failure. Um, you know, it's, it's, it, it can be frustrating, but um, it, things haven't changed over the years. The, the rate of failure has been pretty consistent. And um, a lot of work needs to be done just to get one product to market. Again, uh, you know, just to reemphasize that even though we, we characterize things as rare disease, if you look at rare diseases in general, they're, they're pretty common. Um, so there's a lot of unmet need. And then rare disease is a growing area of focus um, in new product development, I think across um, you know, uh, um, all possible um, indications, you know, all possible therapeutic areas, there's a, a, an increased emphasis in rare disease and it's in increasing year over year. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Allie to speak about um, clinical research organizations, uh, very important partners um, for us as pharmaceutical and biotech companies and uh, making sure that products get developed. Great, thank you so much, Jason, for an excellent presentation as well. So as Jason mentioned, my name is Ali Smith and I work in IQVIA's Pediatric and Rare Disease Center of Excellence. So IQVIA is a, a company that is not uh, consumer facing or, or generally facing the public. So you may not 
have heard of it, I wouldn't be surprised. It's a clinical research organization. Um, and essentially, you know, the most important part uh, of any clinical trial is clearly the patients. Um, you know, we strongly believe that. Uh, I think all stakeholders, especially in the rare disease world, recognize how key um, patients are to everything we're trying to achieve. So not only do patients have <laughs> the rare disease that we're trying to solve, um, but patients are also incredibly insightful about, you know, how best we can tackle uh, that disease area. And so absolutely patients are, are key stakeholders in clinical trials. You know, Jason described pharma and biotech companies who really, you know, want to discover these drugs um, to help uh, patients and families impacted by rare disease and other diseases. Um, often uh, pharmaceutical companies in particular and many biotechs will also sell these drugs. But when it comes to actually testing the drugs in humans, there's a lot of different people. It's actually phenomenal how many people are involved in making sure that human drug testing is safe and that we're not wasting any data and we're doing everything to the highest possible ethical standards. Um, and there's also a lot of expertise that needs to go into. So, you know, how do we collect the data? What does the data mean? How do we work with the hospitals who are seeing the patients? And that is where companies like IQVIA come in um, because we essentially are experts at running inhuman clinical trials. And we work with lots of different companies um, essentially to take drugs through different stages. And I'll talk a little bit more about some of the stages. Um, of clinical trials. So we're very um, behind the scenes to, to the consumer, but if you've participated in a clinical trial, there's a good chance it would be IQVIA or another company that's all a clinical research organization who are actually running that study in terms of being the go-between between, between the sponsor, Jason's company, um, and the hospital sites. And then the hospitals are obviously finding the patients. And we always, we tend to, especially in rare disease, really rely on um, the staff at the hospitals um, to help identify patients and figure out with those patients and families if the clinical trial is going to be a good fit for them, because we really uh, trust the, the amazing site staff that we work with and, and they know patients and families really better um, than anyone else to determine between them should they participate in a clinical trial. So I would see those as kind of the four major players. We're a bit of a behind the scenes player, but very critical, I think, in organizing what's a very complex process with, that needs high ethical standards. Um, and also making sure that every data point gets collected and is used because especially in rare disease studies, we don't have the option, like if you're doing a diabetes study, you may have the option to get a few more patients because there's so many diabetes patients out there. Um, for one individual rare disease that you're looking at, it can be incredibly tough to find uh, enough patients to satisfy and the data needs that we have for that program. So to find out enough about that drug. So we really have to take care to protect every single piece of data that we get from patients, especially how much they've often put themselves out to provide that data to us. So this is just to illustrate that companies like IQVIA will work across lots of different rare disease indications. As Jason mentioned, you know, one in 10 Americans um, have a rare disease. Rare diseases collectively are not rare, but there are 7,000 rare diseases. And many of these can be incredibly rare individually. So there's just a tremendous amount of really difficult studies to tackle and a very high unmet need. And that's, again, where this kind of expertise of being able to understand for each of those rare disease indications, how we can help um, bring products to market or how we can help um, get those clinical trials recruited on behalf of, of companies um, is really useful because really rare disease is a completely different space from other, I think, indications. And I think this goes, you all in the community know, I think this goes back to um, when you get a diagnosis or when you're in the diagnostic odyssey, struggling to find a diagnosis. If I go back to the diabetes example, you know, a, a patient who presents with 
diabetes may actually have been diagnosed pre-diabetic, their primary physician will be anticipating their progression to diabetes, they'll know a lot about the disease condition, if the patient unexpectedly has to present at A&E, for example, ER in the US, um, then you know, a lot of people will know a lot about that disease. There's a lot of support in the community. And as you all know, in rare disease communities, there's less support um, outside of that immediate community in, in the general public. There's less um, discussion about disease management and awareness. And so there are fundamentally fewer patients as well who can participate in clinical trials. And so we, as a clinical research organization in partnership with pharmaceutical companies, often need to take a very different approach to how we might find patients um, for our clinical studies and bring them in. And that really does rely on being able to identify patients. And that's where patient advocacy groups are tremendous in helping us connect with patients and families and also finding the right hospitals. And, and again, just go back to saying how fantastic, you know, all of the, the hospital staff that we work with to help us really get patients and families involved in our programs, giving uh, tremendous insight and knowledge and also, uh, if appropriate for them, uh, participating in that clinical research. So I mentioned briefly about patient advocacy groups. I wanted to share some examples. You know, IDF clearly is doing tremendous work um, for your community. There are other patient advocacy groups that have also done a tremendous amount of work and, you know, really ensuring that patients and families are engaged with the patient advocacy group that's relevant to their area can have a really profound impact on um, the, the chance that a treatment in that indication will be found because patient advocacy groups can really represent um, you know, uh, the patient voice from a lot of different rare disease patients um, and really work very closely with pharmaceutical companies and clinical research organizations and regulators to try and bring um, treatment back to that um, patient population. And some examples I wanted to share here, I mean, the one that really stands out um, is the Children's Tumor Foundation. That's the first example I put. So, um, you know, uh, neurofibromatosis is not even that rare of a disease, but nobody was interested in finding treatments for it. Um, but some researchers funded by this patient advocacy group actually found that um, there was uh, a, a particular cancer pathway um, where the drugs that are being developed for these large kind of tumor indications, you know, breast cancer or lung cancer, uh, may be, uh, have some activity for neurofibromatosis. And because all the patients and families have been very involved with this patient advocacy group, um, you know, the patient advocacy group knew a lot about these patients and families, obviously themselves often being uh, parents of, of rare disease uh, uh, patients, of uh, neurofibromatosis patients, the whole collective community went to the pharmaceutical companies that were developing these medicines and said, hey, we've got the patients, you know, we want, we want to test this treatment in our population. And, and just last year, there was an approval of a drug for the first time specifically for neurofibromatosis. So, I just wanted to illustrate how important the patient and family voices in achieving getting um, rare disease drugs to market and working with patient advocacy groups as patients and families, providing data um, and also providing your insights and opinion can really can really drive change in the, the disease area that's impacting your family. So I just wanted to touch briefly on the fact that there are very different clinical trial phases. Traditionally, we talk about phase one, where we're often testing in, in healthy humans. We have phase two studies where we're often trying to really define exactly which patients are going to benefit um, and also collect a little bit of efficacy data. That means to check that the drug is working before you go into big phase three studies, um, which are often more representative of the total population um, and, and uh, in bigger indications can be quite big. Um, you often, if, if 
your drug works, you'll get approval after phase three, but there may be some questions that FDA still has about whether your drug is safe or whether it works in that patient population. So, but typically in rare and ultra rare diseases, we see quite a different development pathway. And that is really because the unmet need is so high because there just aren't treatments already in existence. So you're not trying to show you're better than a different treatment that once a treatment's been identified, everybody's working to get this treatment to market as quickly as possible so that patients can access it. But we still need to make sure it's safe. So you may be asked to participate in a natural history study. That's where we find out more about that particular disease. Because again, diabetes, we know a lot about ultra rare and rare diseases. Sometimes we don't know as much about how to show that a drug has worked in that indication. Um, then they may mesh phase one and two studies into one study that they call a phase one slash two. So that's just showing it's testing that a drug is safe in a patient population and also that it works and kind of combining that all into one study. And then if FDA are happy with that one study being enough to give it to more people, they may approve the drug at that point, but then ask for a lot more data to be collected even after that, that um, study has been given approval. So you may be asked to participate uh, in future in any one of these studies, and they all serve slightly different purposes. Buffy and her colleagues are absolutely expert at explaining these. But I just wanted to touch a little bit on why you may see some different terminology about different clinical trials um, and why it doesn't always fit with what you might see right away when you Google kind of clinical trial and what does this phase mean. It's because in rare disease, we do do things a little bit differently to try and really expedite bringing that drug to market. So I just wanted to highlight, I think this is true for everybody I've met who works in rare disease that, you know, we're all totally committed at making sure that the patients and families are really represented um, in all of the work uh, that, that everyone's doing to try and bring more uh, treatments to rare disease patients and families. So we're, we're trying to listen, uh, you know, as much as we can, but insights are always welcome. Certainly working with patient advocacy groups really allows biotech and clinical research organizations to tap into your insights um, and views in a way that uh, is sufficiently regulated. So we can kind of make sure that everybody's signed all the proper paperwork and we're all interacting in the way that we should. Um, but you know, the more that patients and families input into um, clinical development and clinical design, the more that you're engaged with this whole process, um, the more successful I think that we'll all be in being able to find treatments for, for hopefully a much higher than 95% of the rare diseases that don't have treatments. So I'm going to hand over to Buffy now, who, uh, well, I'll leave you to give your own introduction, Buffy, uh, and I will stop sharing. Thank you for uh, having me participate in this. Uh, I've been a research nurse at NIH for many years. I'm in the Human Genome Research Institute, but uh, I also uh, collaborate a lot with the Allergy and Infectious Disease Institute, and we study primary immune deficiency. In my case, I work with patients with uh, ADA deficient SCID and Wiscott Aldrich syndrome. And uh, I'm going to talk about clinical trials. Basically, my perspective is the NIH perspective. There are many kinds of clinical trials. Some are treatment trials or interventional for medicines, for devices, new approaches, even something so simple as sutures. Not all of these are done at NIH. And, uh, but the, there are clinical trials for everything that you've ever swallowed in terms of medicine. And there are prevention studies such as um, the medicine called um, Preservision to prevent uh, worsening of macular degeneration. It's basically a lot of uh, vitamins and minerals that are in that medicine, but that is a that was all done through the National Eye Institute, and it has really helped a lot of people's vision. There are diagnostic studies to look at uh, different ways of um, diagnosing particular things. When COVID started, there were not 
good diagnostic tests. Rapidly, they were uh, created and tested, and now we have good diagnostic tests, rapid and the PCR method. And natural history is a very, very large part of um, many studies. And this is true for not just rare diseases, but also common diseases, because many diseases change over time and sometimes get worse. So it's interesting to study that. And then at each phase, there might be other trials people could enter to um, attenuate some of those changes. This is the National Library of Medicine, which is one of the three national libraries. It's located on the NIH campus and is one of the 27 institutes that actually make up NIH. The NLM is the world's largest collection of biomedical literature and a great use of your tax money. Billions and billions of searches are done through their more than 50 dat databases by people all over the world. And they created a, um, a file called clinicaltrials.gov. Next, please. Clinicaltrials.gov is a superb uh, database that contains thousands and thousands of clinical trials, all easy to search, all free to search. And this is where you can go anytime to enter simply your condition or some variety of your condition. And um, you will, it will pop up with thousands of, search of, of results that you can take to your doctor or your healthcare provider and talk about. And, and if you're interested in participating, Sometimes your doctor will use this and present these to you. But the most important thing to realize is that this is just raw data. These are not vetted. There's no qualification the, because it's in clinicaltrials.gov doesn't mean that it's approved by NIH. They're not all NIH studies. They're just all studies. Many are funded by NIH or other academic medical centers around the country, around the world. There, there are studies going on every continent. Every country has studies. So. Sometimes people would choose something based on their geographic location. You have to just decide how far do you want to travel. There are all kinds of eligibility criteria and, and non-eligibility exclusionary criteria. You just have to go through each one that might uh, be applicable to you. And a trial is a protocol or a research plan. And this describes everything that will happen in the study step by step. And some are interventional, some are observational, it, it just depends. And they're all phases. Phase one are the smallest studies with the least amount of people that the primary goal is to determine dose. And, and sometimes within a study, there are different phases that the dose may change depending on the person's response. Uh, phase two studies are a little bit larger population and still concentrating on dose and also side effects. Every phase looks to observe what side effects may be happening. And phase three uh, trials are larger amounts of uh, participants. And, um, you know, many uh, things about the intervention, such as the dose and side effects are known by then. This, this happens over many, many years. Uh, so phase, phase four, the final stage is Often the last stage, things are well known for the effectiveness and the companies are preparing to collect and analyze this data before it's presented to the FDA for something to be approved. And all of these trials do not start without animal studies well before this that also take many years. There, oh yes, so there are a wide variety of people that are eligible to study, sometimes healthy volunteers. All the thousands and thousands and of people that volunteered early for the uh, COVID vaccine trials, those were healthy volunteers. That's how the data was collected so quickly. And uh, a, a lot of information was gathered about the dose, about the side effects, and that's how it moved so quickly. Uh, there are lots of goals to uh, uh, monitor, the study director has to monitor during the study, the toxicity, the dose, drug interactions, and also if the person has other collateral disorders that might be even, uh, it's they're allowed to be eligible, but they have to also be monitored for the effect of the intervention on the collateral disorders. 
So there are, as you can see, there are studies all over the world. And uh, this database has been uh, in existence since 2000. It is a federal regulation that investigators have to have to um, enroll their study in clinicaltrials.gov. And then subsequently, when there are results of the study, those results must be entered into the database also by law. It's updated nightly and it is heavily, heavily used. This is a, a vital resource for clinicians and for the public to use anytime the need arises. So, um, the, the uses of this are to identify trials of interest for a person or a community, to track the progress of a trial. Maybe, you'll, maybe a doctor would read about the results of a trial in a journal, but didn't, wasn't familiar with that investigator. So this is a way to, be, to identify collaborators because maybe they're interested in the same thing. And uh, it, it, when you open the screen, your screen shows results, you'll be able to see trials that are closed or that have results or closed that don't have results or open or yet to open. You know, they, there's all different levels of, of uh, trials that you can investigate. And remember uh, what I said before, that these are not vetted. These are for you to take to your healthcare provider and talk about and ask questions, ask lots of questions. What is going to be done in the study? How is it going to be done? Where do I have to go? Is it going to cost me any money? Generally, there's no charge for much of the study, depending on where you are. Uh, how long will it take? Who's going to monitor me? There are These are all investigational trials. However, you may withdraw at any time there, without any consequences or repercussions to you. And if there are any complications, you're entitled to have those treated as part of the study. You're not just like left hanging. All trials are uh, monitored by independent institutional review boards and none of the people on the board are, in, are part of the study at all. They're all independent and um, this is for your safety, and this is for monitoring the safety of future trials. It even monitors the conduct and the ethical conduct of the investigator. And this is deliberate. These uh, review boards are in every institution and its requirement. So um, this, is, this is something that people participating in clinical trials should be reassured of. They're not just like going into a black hole with the doctor they just met, and there, there are important and complete levels of safety. Uh, this is a sample screen how you can start your search. You go just clinicaltrials.gov, you type in the little box, and uh, think of other ways that your condition is expressed. So there's a immune deficiency called Job syndrome, and you can put in J-O-B, and um, or it, the, another way to describe this is hyper IgE syndrome. So you can type all that in, or you can write H I E S, and you know you will get probably similar uh, results. But sometimes something will pop up because it's it's very text sensitive. So there are other organizations that exist to provide support, uh, as Dr. Smith. Uh, we told us about her organization. All of the patient advocacy groups have resources that um, will help you and guide you possibly to maybe they know an investigator that is a specialist in your condition or your child's condition and uh, can make suggestions. You don't have to, this is not a blind search. You know, you can have uh, input from many other sources that are knowledgeable about the studies in the field of the particular disorder. Uh, so continue to ask questions uh, of the investigator at the, when you, if you click on one of the results that come up at the very, very bottom generally is the inf contact information for the investigator and also the information for the study nurse or study coordinator. And it's another way that you can learn more but definitely talk to your doctor or your healthcare provider about uh, participation in any study, no matter what phase it is, no matter how simple it is, because, you know, these are all important. This is how science grows. This is how people make progress in terms of new treatments being created, new diagnostics being created. It can't happen without 
people participating in clinical trials. They can't ever get approval to go forward by the FDA without having this data from this research. And your participation may benefit you and may not benefit you, but definitely science will learn. Everybody hopes that it will benefit them or their family member, but you have to um, go into this with an open mind that you, know, you may re receive benefits, but you may receive risks. So these are things to talk about with your healthcare provider. More questions to ask, who's funding the study? Uh, when do you get results? Who will oversee your care? What are your options if you are injured? These are all questions to ask of the investigator. And, you know, mostly, um, this takes time to think about, talk about with your family. You have to know the answers to all of these so you'll be comfortable participating. And um, you have to be comfortable with the doctors that are going to monitor you and, and treat you. This is you know, There's an online training that it's all on the first screen that you can just have a tutorial how to do it. But really, it's quite simple. Just type in your words and enter and things will pop up and you can go from there, click each one has a different uh, set of uh, criteria. And then you can, after you get further into it and there's advanced searches where you can limit it by a particular geographic area. If you only wanna stay on the East Coast or the West Coast, or if you want, if you are in another country and you wanna just limit it to that country or to two or three countries around your country. And this is just logistical for travel purposes. And how are you going to get to this? How are you going to get to the site? Is it inpatient? Is it outpatient? So clinicaltrials.gov is the main site. And uh, I hope you'll just try it out and find something that maybe will help you or help your family. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Elizabeth. We're now at the point for Q&A for the session. So before we do that, I just wanted to, to make a, a, a statement and it was alluded to a few times that prior to even stage one clinical trials in humans, the amount of research that is done prior to that, both in, you know, in test tube and in Petri dishes and in everything else before they even get to various animal models, which they slowly escalate to get closer and closer to what they think uh, will be human reactions before even clinical uh, trials start in phase one. So there's a whole entire process that goes before that to try and as best as is possible, make sure that by the time the first human is participating, that they, are, they have a reasonable expectation that it is going to be safe. And those are the very first things that they test for anyhow. So with that being said, uh, I've got uh, a few questions. Let's see here, we've got one. Uh, I think I'll direct this towards uh, Jason if I can. Um, does the FDA give any allowances for rare disease product development due to the uncommon nature of the disease? No, oh, that's an excellent question. Um, the textbook answer is no, that uh, any product that's developed in the United States has the same bar for safety and efficacy, whether it's for a million people or for 300 people. Um, in reality, however, if you're doing uh, clinical trials to develop a product of 300 people, um, there's only so many people you can study. There's very um, limited availability of uh, um, patients to enroll in clinical trials. So if the, if the biology makes sense, um, there are allowances that are made for uh, modifications of clinical trials that make sense so that we can get therapies to, to uh, patients. Uh, you know, prime example is uh, um, a disease with three, 400 patients may only be tested in 20 or 30 patients, um, which you would never happen in a, in a disease that's, you know, uh, um, indicated for a million people. You know, we do much larger clinical trials and it may not go through all the phases. So some of the phases may be combined that we talked about. Um, Ali showed a nice slide where phase one, two was combined. Um, I've seen phase two and three combined. And the intent is to make sure that um, if a therapy is going to work, that we make sure it's safe and efficacious and are able to get it to market. Um, so the FDA is very reasonable um, in their discussions about getting a, a development program to make sure that we can get something to market. Excellent, thank you for that. We have another question here. Uh, this is directed to, to Ali. Can you please expand and tell us a little bit about how you find the hospitals who carry out the clinical studies? 
Sure, absolutely. So it's it's absolutely key that we're working with the right hospitals, as I mentioned, because although patients, um, Buffy did a great job of explaining on clinicaltrials.gov, patients can look for clinical trial sites. It makes a lot of sense if patients are already being treated to work with the doctors who are treating them, especially in rare disease, because often those doctors uh, are looking for new treatments for their patients. So they're both researchers and clinicians at the same time because they want to try and find treatments for their patients. So we really try and look for um, hospitals where patients and families already are and often um, patient advocacy groups can be a great help in telling us which doctors are great and which hospitals are great. Um, but also um, doctors publish a lot of information in journals um, about different things that they're working on. And so that can also be a way for us to find hospitals. In general, in rare and ultra rare diseases, we tend to work with pretty major institutions and major hospitals simply because they have access to the most number of patients. Excellent, thank you for that. And then I think uh, we have a question here for Elizabeth. So, it, and it's kind of a, a two-part question. Can you tell us about any current exciting trials you might be involved with or, or, or working with at NIH? And maybe particularly, do you know of any that are currently going on for individuals with primary immune deficiency diseases? Well, um, that's a good question. There are lots and lots of trials. I think um, it's a little broad to say generally Immune, immunodeficiency diseases. Doctors at NIH really are very much um, specific to a disorder. They don't generalize, except for one doctor who, um, well, two doctors that do bone marrow transplant. There is an expanding amount of uh, interest in treating bone marrow with bone marrow transplant for immune deficiencies, not any specific one. Although there are protocols just for specific ones, but mostly people st study one or two very limited disorders in the same area. And it's just for conservation of resources, but everybody collaborates. So maybe one doctor is a skid specialist. One doctor is a specialist for Job syndrome. One doctor is a specialist for chron chronic granulomatous disease, which is interesting because if you type in CGD in that search box, you will get chronic granulomatous disease. And then there's another metabolic disease, which is called congenital disorders of glycosylation, completely different, but it'll come up. So you have to filter through everything. Uh, yeah, we have, uh, we have many, many world-class experts at NIH that study all kinds of primary immune deficiencies. Great. Well, I think if I look at the Q&A queue, that's all the questions we have, and we're just about right on time. So our session has come to an end. So please join me in thanking Dr. Brett, Dr. Smith, and Ms. Garabedian for joining us today. I look forward to seeing everyone here at 12 noon Eastern time for the session, What Does It Mean to Be a Carrier? So once again, thank you very much to our speakers. Thank you to all of you who've joined us on this Saturday morning or afternoon, depending on where you are, Allie. So thanks again, folks, and we'll see you uh, in just a little bit at noon. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Bye.